like to invite Geneviève Boutin to help us reflect to some of the, the restrictions that may pose an additional challenge to the humanitarian operation. Uh, Geneviève is the chief of uh, humanitarian policy in UNICEF in the Office of Emergency Programs where she leads a team that supports UNICEF's country offices in you know, delivering an efficient and timely humanitarian response. Um, Geneviève has worked in a number of countries over the last 12 years working um, in Haiti, in the Republic of Congo, in Burundi, in Somalia, but now she focuses in particular on how to make UNICEF operations in humanitarian response more effective and will help us understand the, the particular challenges that the counterterrorism legislation poses in this environment. Thanks, Genevieve. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> Can you hear me well? Very well, thanks. Yes, we Thank hear you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of uh, this panel. Uh, I'm very excited and honored to be uh, joined, joining these uh, experts whom we've heard already speak on Mali. As requested, I want to talk <coughs> about the um, possible, actual and possible implications of counter-terrorist legislation on humanitarian operations in Mali. And also, uh, at the end of my remarks, also just broaden the scope a little bit to talk about uh, not only the legislation, but the, what we expect will be the implications of the heavy counter-terrorist military operation that's being conducted at the moment on humanitarian uh, assistance in Mali. Uh, first, some background. Uh, as has been said, the presence of proscribed entities in northern Mali, of course, is not a new fact. ACME has been present for five to ten years and has been listed as a foreign terrorist uh, organization, by, both by the U.S. government and by the United Nations for almost a decade. Uh, but what has changed, obviously, is the effective control of large uh, chunks of territory by various armed groups throughout 2012, and a situation that is, uh, of course, evolving uh, as we speak. But from the moment that uh, these uh, groups came into control of significant portions of, of territory, overlay with the humanitarian crisis that David has described, which had begun with the nutritional crisis and was exacerbated by the fighting, this is where the uh, fundamental challenge emerges for humanitarian organizations as we are pressed to reach uh, groups within these areas with very, very limited access for ourselves to be present with our staff, forced to implement in remote programming mode where uh, and through any means possible, pressed by a sense of urgency to provide life-saving assistance, but at the same time uh, challenged by the existence of these counter-terrorist uh, legislations. Now, of the three main armed groups that we're working, uh, that are present in northern Mali, as I mentioned, Akim uh, is, uh, Akmi is a listed terrorist entity, both by the U.S. and the U.N. and several other bilateral governments. Ansardine, at the moment, is not listed as a foreign terrorist organization, though, of course, the rhetoric in the Council over the last few weeks, ever since some factions of Ansardine has, have been believed to be part of the drive to uh, take Mopti in early January, the rhetoric suggests that we might see a listing of certain uh, leaders or certain um, factions within that group in the coming weeks. Uh, the Mujao became listed as a foreign terrorist organization by the American uh, government in December uh, 2011 and as well by the United Nations uh, Sanctions Committee under 1267. Um, also to note, of course, that we operate in this area with the presence, the reported presence of Boko Haram, which is also a listed entity under uh, the, the various al-Qaeda regimes, uh, both national and international, and that the implications of these listings are obviously not limited to Mali, because as these groups are also present in other neighboring countries, most recently reports of presence of Mujao fighters in Darfur, for example, we're going to come in contact with them in our attempts to deliver assistance in several other humanitarian contexts. Um, what's really complicated in this particular situation of northern Mali is, of course, the very fluid nature of the situation and the fact that understanding who's in control of the situ the, a certain uh, portion of the territory at a given time is extremely complex. Allegiances are shifting within, and it's very hard for humanitarians to have valid intelligence about who we're actually dealing with. Moreover, as is often the case, of course, in such environments, the business sector uh, that has access and on which we depend in order to deliver supplies and assistance to these areas is of course embedded with the various groups in ways that are very difficult for us to understand. Now, uh, what does counter-terrorist legislation mean for humanitarians? First, uh, 
Counterterrorist legislations actually create obligations for states, not for humanitarian organizations. This is an important fact that I always like to emphasize because just the very notion of the existence of these legislations tend to have a very paralyzing and freezing effect on humanitarian organizations, understandably so. However, because the national governments, in particular the United States, have created national legislations that actually criminalize uh, transactions with these groups by entities that are known as U.S. entities, which is an extremely broad term and reflects, you know, basically um, uh, applies to any organization that has connections with the U.S. or any uh, U.S. citizen, whether working in the U.S. or abroad or whatnot. Basically, through these legislations, there's a bite back effect, which means that uh, engagement with groups listed as foreign terrorist groups <coughs> may actually have very patience for humanitarians. As far back as 2007, the Center for Humanitarian uh, Dialogue, for example, conducted a study amongst humanitarians to list what their concerns were, what were the fears that they had that were, in, that were basically getting in the way of them to deliver effective humanitarian assistance. And people listed the risk of prosecution of individual staff member, the risk that a humanitarian organization might be listed itself for having had contact or having uh, conducted transactions with a, a listed entity, adverse media coverage, reputational damage to the organization, the contraction of humanitarian space, and constraints on funding, which is something that we saw a very real fact in Somalia in 2009, and which was partly, um, uh, to which people partly attributed this slow response to the famine there. The very legal intricacies are, are discussed in many, many papers, including a very good HPG policy brief, so I'll leave it at that in terms of the legal aspects and kind of really uh, boil down to what does it mean for humanitarians. Um, and to say, the way I describe this, I always try, of course, to, to stay away from very, um, uh, the, the types of analysis that may basically make humanitarians fearful and freeze us in our attempts to provide assistance. So first of all, there is absolutely nothing in counter-terrorist -legis legislation that provides that, that stops humanitarians from providing assistance in the areas that are geog geographic areas that are under the control of listed entities. So that's important to note, and any attempt to limit the geographic scope of distribution of humanitarian assistance by anyone, uh, be, be it the national host government or other governments, on the basis of the presence of terrorist listed entities, actually should not be uh, a recognizable claim. Uh, and in fact, it hasn't happened so far in Mali, although uh, we might see some of these types of pressures uh, of attempts to basically politicize or, or uh, instrumentalize humanitarian assistance in an attempt to regain the territory. In terms of humanitarian negotiations also, uh, anti-terrorist and sanctions regimes are basically silent on the issue of humanitarian dialogue with non-state entities. However, because of the way material support is defined in counter-terrorist legislation, Basically, the very notion of speaking to or advocating with a listed group could be construed as material support in an extreme case. And therefore, there is um, here some value in humanitarian seeking a coordinated uh, approach to humanitarian negotiations and to a certain extent possibly a role, a strong role for humanitarian coordinator, uh, United Nations humanitarian coordinator to the extent that we believe the privileges and immunities might protect us a little bit more in relative terms. What's really the, the big issue here is contracting and transactions. And the challenge, as I said before, is that in an environment like Northern Mali, you don't really know uh, who is who in the business sector and what their relations are. And therefore, any transactions either way, receiving uh, uh, goods or services and or giving goods or services that benefit a listed entity, that makes anybody liable of criminal pursuit. Um, and that's where I think uh, our answer, our, our best response lies. The last implication is resource mobilization. Uh, it's very important for donors to exercise restraint and to not impose on humanitarians some uh, demands on, for example, vetting partners which could make it impossible for us to uh, uh, operate. Although I have to say at the moment, at least from the case of UNICEF, we have not received a lot of pressure from donor governments. There's been a lot of restraint exercise, gladly so, and we hope that would continue. The best response, we argue, is due diligence. It's basically for the humanitarian uh, community to be proactive in putting in place measures of due diligence um, 
to ensure that we understand the environment in which we work and to the best extent possible we put in place measures that would limit the risk of diversion or misuse or of resources falling into the hands of listed entities. And that actually is something that's beneficial not only in, in order to protect us against counter-terrorist legislation, but in order for us to avoid falling in the trap where we support a war economy and contribute to, to putting in place the conditions uh, that in Northern Mali for basically um, this instability to, to continue. And again, you know, uh, our experience in Somalia was that for many years uh, we used the argument of humanitarianism to avoid looking deep inside at the way in which we were contracting or understanding whom we were really working with. And we're having very uh, inadvertently very negative impacts on, on uh, our efforts that, on the other hand, to um, promote sustainable peace in Somalia. So we've argued that there should be in place some common risk management measures, monitoring a better understanding of the situation, as David pointed out, of who's who and exchange of information among humanitarian actors so that we avoid engaging into transactions that directly or indirectly benefit anybody who actually not has, does not have an interest in peace, uh, whether terrorists uh, listed or not. Now, just to move on quickly, a few points about the broader implications of the counterterrorism intervention. I think um, from the standpoint of humanitarian organizations, the, the discourse that emerged in January out of the Council in particular, but also the AU and ECOWAS, where from a resolution 2085 that was basically authorizing a force to restore state authority in the context of political negotiations, we've gone to a heavy rhetoric of counterterrorism, of rooting out terrorist groups at all costs, uh, which actually mixes everything up and uh, addresses all these uh, non-state groups as though they were on the same status of terrorist uh, designation or not. Uh, for us, it's a real concern because that means that our ability to be perceived as neutral uh, and impartial as we deliver humanitarian assistance in northern Mali is seriously undermined, especially as we hear calls for a heavy UN support package to ECOWAS troops and possible rehatting of these troops. So we will be very concerned to ensure that in the design of how this um, next phase of the intervention uh, is conducted forward, that um, provisions are in place to, uh, to enable humanitarians to retain a specific voice and a specific visibility as opposed to these other uh, important components of the international intervention. Finally, there's a lot that's been done in Mali. The, the humanitarian team there was very proactive. They have begun to put in place risk management measures, which we can discuss further for those who are interested, and adopted already last year a common framework for humanitarian assistance in which they've set out some red lines that are extremely helpful to ensure that we're already uh, implementing due diligence. And I do believe that that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen heavy pressure from donors on the counter-terrorist legislation is this proactiveness and openness to discuss the risks. Thank you very much.